freedom. What is the meaning of freedom to you? What is your understanding of that word? And what is to be free, finally? I think freedom for me has to do with being able to be yourself, to know yourself, first of all, which, you know, some of, oh, yeah. some of us have spent over 50 years figuring that out. That's true. <laughs> um, but also being able to be yourself and, you know, to love yourself enough to bring, bring yourself along in your interactions. Being able to love yourself enough to bring it forward and to live by that wisdom of knowing who you are, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my dream for everybody is that their first thought they have when they wake up in the morning is, I'm enough. Do you believe in the practice of unconditional self-love? Oh, yeah. I think that that really is a practice. We get lots and lots and lots of opportunities just in how we speak to ourselves all day long with practicing that. So how do we learn or the process of learning to recognize mold sickness Talk to me about that and what are the challenges in recognizing, diagnosing mold sickness? The challenges are that everybody's way to exhibit their mold sickness can look different. So um, it's important to understand then what are about the mold makes people sick. And that's the spores, spore fragments, the chemicals that happily living mold, I call it mold farts in my book because it's that's funny. <laughs> Try to get, you know, lightness everywhere we can. Right. Um, but you know, they're they're emitting all of this off gassing, and that can be things like alcohol, so you can feel drunk, um, aldehydes, which makes you chemically sensitive. So there's all these chemicals that they're spitting out. But then if mold feels threatened, it will spit out these super duper toxic chemicals called mycotoxins and it will do that to compete out its territory from other living things so it's not really we're not the target it's trying to gas bomb out other molds and bacteria that want to move into that water damaged building um, but we definitely are affected by it the intention of that toxin is to kill other living things so when you realize that that's what the intention is holy moly that's big the other thing about these toxins that makes them very poisonous is that they're lipid soluble or fat soluble, not water soluble. And what that means is that they can absorb into the body really quickly and they stay. <laughs> so you can accumulate them. And the areas that they tend to absorb into are nervous system, GI, skin, organs of detoxification and hormones. So you can imagine now with that broad list that I just gave, that means that there could be lots and lots of different symptoms. The bulk of the symptoms that we see the most common is going to be fatigue. And that fatigue could look like for a competitive athlete that they're having a hard time and their VO2 max is going down, that they can't work out as hard. Or for somebody who's really affected, it can be that they literally can't walk up at a flight of stairs without getting winded. So there can be lots of variances of what that fatigue looks like, depending on what your health status is coming into your exposure. And then, you know, being that they're lipid soluble, they can go into all these different tissues. If you are already kind of toxic or your nutritional status is not solid, or you have genetic susceptibility to mold toxins, you can display those symptoms a lot quicker than the other people in that environment. So fatigue is a biggie. Wow, so that's it might be the number one symptom to look for or to be aware mm -hmm. of. I think, yeah, and wow. you, what we can explain that away is all kinds of things. You know, I'm getting older, um, I'm stressed, I didn't sleep very well, you know, all kinds of different things can be explained away. And that's what we did in our own house. We were explaining away all these symptoms on other things. We were pinning them on other things so that it made sense. Mold is very sneaky. The other thing that I see a lot of people with mold have is anxiousness. And I'm careful not to say anxiety because a lot of people have an idea about what anxiety looks like, like a panic attack. But I'm talking about something that's just an inner sense of unsettled, restless, things aren't okay. And that is consistent with almost every patient that I've worked with with mold. So what are the differences exactly, Dr. Krista, between Lyme disease and mold sickness? Yeah, I had a very hard time figuring this out in clinic, and that's why I created that questionnaire that's in the beginning of the book. Uh, that questionnaire is my clinical questionnaire. As you see, as you're sitting there looking at it, it's pretty detailed and it's long, And but it helped me in practice quantify 
symptoms. And Lyme and mold, if there is a Venn diagram, they cross each other very, very, very closely. What I've learned from my teacher, Dr. Richard Horowitz, who is a genius and a Lyme, father of Lyme disease, by looking at his questionnaire, which is what inspired my questionnaire, his MSIDS Lyme questionnaire, he found that cardinal symptom that distinguishes Lyme from any other co-infections that you would get with Lyme disease is that there's a migration of your symptom. So an example would be like if you had arthritis in your knee and suddenly the knee arthritis got a little bit better, but your first finger joint, first joint on your finger is suddenly swollen up. That's a classic Lyme disease thing. Mold doesn't do that. It doesn't wander around the body. It has a tendency to have ups and downs, so flares and calm, that are going to be more related to your exposure than to just these random migrations. So those would be some ways to kind of pull them apart, but they are both the classic imitators. They can imitate almost any condition.